Welcome folks, welcome to another edition of the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about fixed rate mortgages versus variable rate mortgages and what is best for you. There's a general rule of thumb that I've come to realize over the 20 years, 20 plus years I've been a homeowner that I wish someone would have told me back when I started out buying houses in 1998. Essentially, if you think you're going to be in your house for more than five years, uh, you should be in a fixed rate mortgage. Not every time I get that a situation will dictate, but generally speaking, the five years is a cutoff, a good rule of thumb for cutoffs. So let me give you an example that we did when we moved around. We bought our first house in Phoenix in 1998. 2002, we bought our second house in Virginia. 2008, we bought our third house in Texas. 2011, we bought our fourth house in New Jersey. And in 2013, we bought our fifth house in Georgia, which is where we are today. Because we always took a fixed rate mortgage, because I'm pretty conservative in that regard, always worried about the risks, we've left an awful lot of money on the table. We paid an extraordinary amount of interest that we really did not have to pay if I would have even considered a variable rate mortgage. But I didn't. It seemed like too much risk. I remember it was like it was yesterday, signing the closing documents for my house in Phoenix in 2000 and 1998, using a VA loan and getting 7% money. And I was thinking, man, I'm glad I'm walking this in because you will never see money this cheap again. <laughs> how wrong I was, how wrong I was. And that literally has led me to, uh, I've always thought that every time we bought a new home, I always said, oh, you'll never see money this cheap again as the interest rates just went down and down and down. Now, that does not mean the interest rates can't go up and it can you know, bite in the bud if you do a, uh, a variable rate mortgage. But we're going to talk about some examples I use here from the book to at least give you some background on what you should be considering as you choose a variable rate or a fixed rate. Either way, the, the facts are on the front end of your mortgage, the first five years in particular are just big time interest payments. You're paying a significant amount of interest relative to your principal. And so in a fixed rate mortgage, the, the interest is probably going to be maybe two to three to one, three dollars for every dollar of interest of three dollars of interest for every dollar of principal, maybe two. It depends on what the rates are. Whereas on a variable rate, if the rate is cheaper, and that's a big if. I don't know. Sometimes the variable rate mortgages can change. But if the rate is cheaper, you might actually be paying more principal on the first payment of your loan than you will interest just because the rates are so low. And that first five years really is going to, the, the amount of interest you pay relative to the principal, especially on a fixed rate mortgage, is, is incredible, actually. And I want you to have that principal, that interest in your pocket as opposed to the bank, especially, especially if you think you're going to be in that house for less than five years. And just in hindsight, I wish someone would have told me this. Now, even though some may have told me or if they would have, that doesn't mean I would have heeded their advice. Now, you know, I've just been raised conservatively for to watch my bottom, my bottom line, what risks that are out there, which is why I'm a pretty good financial planner because you always have the what if. But man, I just in hindsight look back, I said, ah, oh, I wish I had that interest. I could have used that, you know, absolutely. So be advised. I'm, I'm telling you what no one told me when I was 27 years old or so, 28, I guess, when I bought my first house, five years. Think about it. Are you going to be there for five years? If so, a fixed rate looks good. If not, a variable rate looks good. So let's go over some numbers that I use in the book. Let me minimize myself here. Yeah. In this, I'm just using an example from Navy Federal Credit Union that they had in uh, 2017. All right. So they were offering a 30-year fixed rate mortgage at 3.75%. 30-year fixed at 375 and I just chuckled because uh, when I took my first mortgage at 7%, again, I never thought we'd see cheap money like that again and, and look where we are today look where we've been for a long long time so in august of 2017 and i don't know what it's doing now i do know in uh, this is march of 2018 the tenure has gone up quite a bit the tenure treasury bond and uh, that's usually the proxy for interest rates as a whole uh, you know so it went up from like 2.35 to about 2.8 is where we're at today Typically, the 30-year bond doesn't quite is not as quite as volatile as a 10, but certainly the 30-year bond is higher today than it was in August of 2017. So just bear with me here. The numbers that you see here certainly aren't going to be what you can get online if you go to NavyFederal.org and uh, and look today. But just as an example, this is what we were looking at when I was uh, penning up my book, a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. 
So what I want to share with you is what a 30-year fixed rate mortgage would do after five years. And again, five years is the rule of thumb. And I'll explain that on when we talk about arms here, the variable rate mortgages here in just a second. But essentially, we're going back to Kevin and Brenda. And if you recall, they had a $200,000 house. They put $10,000 down, which meant their mortgage was $190,000. All right, so... $10,000 of equity, $190,000 of mortgage debt at 30 years at 3.75 amortization table meant their payment was $880 a month. Okay, so they were paying $880 a month every month for 360 payments on, uh, on the $190,000 home mortgage. That means after five years, they had total payments. If you go down here, of $52,795. So they paid $52,790, of which only 18, well, let's say 19,000 was principal, and 34,000 was interest. So basically a two to one ratio. For every dollar of principal, they paid $2 of interest. They started with $190,000 as a mortgage balance, and they ended with $171,000 after five years. All right, so that's. That's a lot of money going out and not that much reducing the principal. Now, remember, the issue here was that Brenda had to take a significant pay cut. And again, I'll put, <coughs> excuse me, I'll put a, uh, a link to the video I did on that up here. And so they were going to take a job in a different state to reduce their cash flow or to increase their cash flow and reduce their expenses. The problem they were having, though, was getting out from under the house because the fair market value of the home plummeted, but the mortgage value they, they still held did not. So the market value of the house was dropping, but the mortgage value was not, still at 171. The second drawback is they were living, you know, basically they were, cash, they were breaking, easy, cash, breaking even cash flow wise. So they didn't have a lot of money to save. So they had no savings whatsoever. So that meant when it came time to sell their house, if they were upside down, which they were, they were going to have to come up with some cash to get out from underneath it. And they just didn't have any cash to come up with. So if they would have taken an arm as opposed to a fix, that might have been different. And let's show you what I'm talking about here. So just remember, they had a balance of $171,000 after paying $53,000 of payments over that time. So let's go here to my next sheet. All right, let me move myself up here a little bit. Yeah, there we go. And so this one is what a five-year arm was looking at at Navy Federal, and again, in August of 2017. So at a five-year arm, or three-year arm, excuse me, three years, just three years, had a 1.875 interest rate for the first three years. Now, what an arm is, an adjustable rate mortgage. So a three-year arm means that it's fixed for that amount of term, the three-year in this case, they have five-year arms, they have seven-year arms, they have 10-year arms, they have one-year arms. That number in front of the word, or the, I guess the word, the acronym, ARM is how many years it's fixed for at that current rate. So a five-year arm or a three-year arm, a 10-year arm at 3.875 or 2.875 or 1.875 just means the interest rate at that number is fixed for how many years um, for the adjustable rate mortgage, and then it can change. So in this case, we had a three-year arm at 1.875. So that meant it was fixed for three years. However, and this is where the risk comes that has always made me cringe. After three years, the, in this case, for Navy Federals, the interest rate in year four could go up to 3.875, up 2% from what that was the initial rate. It could go from 1.875 all the way up to 3.875 in year four. And year five can go up another two years to 5.875. And then in year six, it can go to 7.875 where it maxes out. It can't, can't go any, any further up than 7.875. But given where we are today and given where a fixed rate was at 3.75, the threat of it even being at 7.875 is quite frightening, which again is why the five year should be the cutoff for you. That should be your rule of thumb. How long are you going to be there? So in Kevin and Brenda's case, I said, okay, 
Let's just say we had a, an arm. They did an arm instead of that fixed rate, and they had good luck, which meant the interest rate did not change at all over those five years. What would happen? Again, they start off with 190, but instead of a payment being of 880 a month, their payments were 727 a month there, 726 and 80 cents. Which meant after five years, their total payments were $41,000, significantly lower. In fact, that's what, uh, 13, $12,000 lower than it was on the fixed. They paid $12,000 less than they did on the fixed rate mortgage. <laughs> the interesting thing, though, is where the fixed rate mortgage, they only paid $1 principal for every $2 of interest. And here they basically paid $1.50 of principal for every $1 of interest, which meant not only do they pay $12,000 less in monthly payments, total monthly payments, but now they had $6,000 left of an ending balance when it came time for the five years to conclude. So they paid $12,000 less in total payments, which is money back in their pocket, and they had $6,000 less in the principal, which when they sell it is money back in their pocket. So they essentially netted a positive $18,000 relative to the fixed rate mortgage because they had good luck. Now I can hear you thinking, okay, well, that's great. But what if the rates aren't so good? What if they don't have good luck? What happens then, Josh? Well, that's where I did a, I did a, uh, a study on that too here. So this is worst case scenario. And again, worst case scenario is they are flocked in at 1.875 for the first three years. Year four can go up to 3.875 and year five, it can go up to 5.875. Okay. So after five years, the worst case scenario. Now, again, we're not going into year six, seven, and eight because we're assuming that they're going to be out of their home in five years. But the worst case scenario for five years, well, let's take a look. Same thing, 190,000 is the principal initially, the balance, I should say. Uh, the first three years, the monthly payment is 727. But because the interest rates go up in year four, increases their monthly payment to 874, and then again to 1,074 in year five. And that's how it works. The bank re the, the the loan that you have. They take your ending balance or your beginning balance when the rates change. In this case, in year four, the beginning of year four, their ending balance is one uh, beginning balance is one seventy five. Re amortized it based on the current interest rates that you're paying, which meant their monthly payment went up from seven twenty seven to eight seventy four. Ending balance at the or the beginning balance at the the uh, beginning of year five one seventy one. The interest rate now is 5.875, which meant their monthly payment is 1,074, which is significantly higher, 20% higher than what the fixed rate was. But remember, this is the worst case. All right, so what happens? In this case, they paid $48,000 in total payments, which was $7,000 more than they paid in the best case scenario of the, uh, the, the variable rate staying flat at 1.875 but it's $4,000 less than they paid in the fixed rate scenario, even though in year four and five, they had a higher interest rate than they did in the fixed. Year four is 3.875. The fixed was 3.75. Year five is 5.875, and the fixed was 3.875. But because they had such a low interest in the first three years, they still paid less in the worst case scenario over five years than they did and the fixed rate. Now, here is where it starts to turn, all right? The worm starts to turn a little bit. Here they paid $21,000 of principal against $27,000 of interest, okay? So they're paying more interest now, and you can see this, the reason why. Years one through three, three their, their principal is $14,000 they paid down against only $10,000 of interest. Year four, the principal is 4,000 roughly against eight to 7,000 of interest. And then look at that, year five, woo wee, 3,000 of principal versus $10,000 of interest. So year five, they're really getting, they're, they're being taken literally to the bank. They're getting uh, knocked around some, and that's where the five-year thing really needs to be considered. At the end of the day though, even under this worst case scenario, they paid $4,000 less, $5,000 less, less than they did in the, in the uh, fixed rate. And they still had 
four to five thousand dollars uh, four thousand dollars less on their mortgage balance so they still netted almost nine thousand dollars more in their total net worth than they would have on the fixed this is the worst case scenario which is why i bring to your attention are you likely going to be in your home for five years think about it because if you're not likely to and you take that fit that fixed rate you are literally well not literally you are leaving money on the table that could go back in your pocket as opposed to the banks. And I caution you, especially if you're just starting out, because a lot of folks just starting out, they land that first job and they're thinking, yeah, yeah, this is what happened to us. And in hindsight, man, I, I just wish I would have known differently. And again, just because I would have known something doesn't mean I would have acted. But it would have been nice to have known so I could have at least thought the options through. I did not even consider a variable rate. Now, again, I have no clue what the variable rates were at that point. None. A fixed rate of 7%, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what they are now. A variable rate relative to a fixed rate. What I would suggest, though, is that you crunch the numbers. Get yourself to have the bank run your amortization schedules based on worst case scenario. Relative to the variable rate mortgage you're considering versus the fixed rate mortgage you're considering. Look at it from a total payments. How much are you going to totally pay? Worst case scenario, how much of that would be total payments would be principal and how much of that would be interest. And then you'll know your ending mortgage balance on the worst case scenario on both scenarios there. And if the worst case scenario is significantly lower for you on a variable rate mortgage than a fixed, well, you got some thinking to do for sure. Now, if the worst case scenario is a kind of a wash, and you're not sold that you might ever move, it might be worth it to take, to take the fire on the fixed rate. If the rates do go down, you can always uh, re refinance. You're not stuck into that loan. The drawback about refinancing, though, I just want to be clear, man, it takes money to do that. It's not cheap. You got to do a title search. And for some reason, even though the same bank who just loaned you the money, they got to re revisit the title to make sure, you know, some guy from 1922 they didn't have a claim to your property, but you're like, well, you did that when I bought the house to begin with. And that cost 2000 bucks just right there, even though they already got the title search done to prove that there's no lien on your property. It's, eh. And if, on top of that, there's an origination fee, there's closing costs. You got to get the appraisal done now. The attorney's got to come out. And, you know, a lot of this stuff can be done in your living room, but someone's still got to make the effort to come out and notarize your stuff. And that person isn't doing that for free. It all has a cost in there. And even if your bank said there's no cost, well, <laughs> it's costing you something or else the, the banks, as far as I can ever tell, has never been altruistic. Even credit unions, they got to make money. So at the end of the day, there is a cost that you're paying to refinance. And a lot of times it's not cheap. We're talking, you know, the five figures easily. So keep that in mind. All right. Share with me what your experiences are. Have you ever done a fixed rate? Have you ever looked in hindsight and say, oh, man, I should have done a variable? Conversely, have you ever done a variable and got swamped because the rates went against you? You know, it has to be a long time because the rates, the rates have got, gone, have done nothing but go down since 1982. There was a time there in 1994 where Greenspan was raising the rates, uh, which really knocked the market around quite a bit, the stock market and the bond market. In 1994, uh, there is some thought that that might have even cost the Democrats control of Congress in 1994 because the interest rates are going up quite a bit. In 1999, the interest rates went up as well. Um, it, you know, that was right before the election of 2000. But I, I mean, that was pretty significant as well. And if you looked at the bond market when that happened in 94, then again, in 1999, they both got crunched. And the interest rate cycle really turned against you. But quickly, it turned back or at least leveled off. I should say it's probably a better term. It leveled off. It stopped pretty quickly. 1994 was pretty brutal, frankly, um, you know, but we haven't had anything like that other than those two instances since literally 1990, 1982. If you look at 1982, the 30-year tre treasury bond was at 15 and a quarter. All right, so you could buy a 30-year treasury bond and you're getting 15 and a quarter. The last I checked, that was about three and a quarter. All right, now I don't know literally what it is today. I could probably look on my phone. I just don't feel like it. But that's that's how low the rates have gone over the last 35, 36 years. So not likely to happen that the rates spike up. 
Certainly not much more. It can go down, but uh, that is a risk you got to consider. So put that in the comments. As I said before, give me a thumbs up. Turns out thumbs up are very helpful to me to get this YouTube channel uh, exposed to other people who might not be aware of it. And then uh, put comments in there. So like it, subscribe, hit that subscribe button down below. And of course, hit the bell for notifications. The notification sign just says, hey, you got, I put more content out there and you'll get an email. Anytime you log into YouTube, you'll see that it says a little red button on that notification bell that you have new content. So look forward to seeing the next Heritage Wealth Planning chapter. If you have any questions, thoughts, or concerns, just put them down below. Thanks, guys. We'll see you.